Hey, it's Lou, and here's the thing. Americans love choice. It's practically baked into our capitalist DNA. In the mood for ice cream, there are dozens of flavors at the grocery store. Need toothpaste? Here's a selection of 50. But when it comes to one of the most consequential choices Americans make, we're effectively stuck with just two. I'm talking about elections, Republican or Democrat. That binary choice contains the only viable options. Yeah, there are technically smaller parties, but none have won a single electoral college vote in over 50 years. In fact, those third party candidates are frequently ridiculed as spoilers that steal votes from one of the mainstream parties and interfere with the two party competition. Now, it's one thing if this Republican Democrat system worked, if it delivered value to citizens, but for many, it doesn't, and there are polling numbers to prove it. Over two thirds of Americans say that neither party does an adequate job representing the American people according to the voter study group. So, how did this duopoly seize and maintain power? And how do we make third parties relevant? We were warned. In 1780, for instance, founding father John Adams wrote, quote, there's nothing I dread so much as the division of the Republic into two great parties. George Washington, in his iconic 1796 farewell address, predicted that political parties would, quote, become potent engines by which cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men will be enabled to subvert the power of the people and to usurp for themselves the reins of government. There are other quotes like this, other pearls of wisdom and foreboding that make the founders sound like prophets of doom. Yet, Joseph Pastel, an associate professor of political science at the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs, told me that many of America's architects wax poetic about the dangers of political parties and then set about creating political parties. James Madison, for instance, warned in Federalist 10, an uber influential essay, that factions would put their own self-interest ahead of the good of the country. Yet, he was one of the driving forces behind the confusingly named Democratic Republican Party. What gives here? Why this about face? Well, Postel explained, the founders assumed that once they toppled the British monarchy, everyone would work together towards a common good. But they soon realized that disagreement was inevitable and parties were the only way to organize around different principles. In other words, at first they were idealistic, hoping for statesmen and wound up being practical, settling for politicians. Since then, the strength of political parties has ebbed and flowed. Their names have changed, but the nation has been stuck with the same basic structure, the same duopoly setup. Since the Civil War, it's been Republicans and Democrats and pretty much nothing else. Charles Whelan, a lecturer at Dartmouth College and author of The Centrist Manifesto, told me to step back and think about this. We live in a culture where we expect a new cell phone every year but we're okay with the same political parties dominating for the better part of 200 years. It's wacky. So how did two become the status quo? Sam Rosenfeld, an assistant professor of political science at Colgate University, pointed to something called Duverger's Law. Basically, Maurice Duverger, a French political scientist, observed that in winner-take-all elections, like we have in the States, citizens tend to be strategic with who they vote for. They're more inclined to pick one of the favorites instead of a long shot they might prefer. Vote with your head, not your heart. This is opposed to a parliamentary system where the parties in second place and below can still earn seats in government, so a long shot vote isn't necessarily wasted. Barbara Perry, director of presidential studies at the University of Virginia's Miller Center, told me there are other structural or system problems maintaining duopoly, like the Electoral College. She told me to consider the 1992 presidential election. Ross Perot, running as an independent, garnered 19% of the popular vote, yet, he won zero, zero electoral college votes. Think about that. Roughly one out of five voters chose Perot, but he didn't register at all on the scoreboard that ultimately matters, i.e. the electoral college. But in a parliamentary system, 19% of the vote would have translated to 19% of the seats up for grabs. Lee Drutman, a senior fellow in the political reform program at the think tank New America, told me the US's winner take all system reinforces itself. People don't like supporting losers, even those they agree with, so they don't vote for third parties. Likewise, donors don't want to be associated with lost causes, so smaller parties tend to be cash strapped. Strong candidates and campaign staff, in turn, tend to avoid broke, destined to fail operations, so instead the small parties tend to get personnel from the fringe. Hi, my name is Roman Supreme, 
and uh, I'm generally known as a person who's running for president. The media is generally inclined to ignore them, and the vicious cycle spins the small parties further and further into irrelevance. Moreover, Drutman told me there is a social pressure to avoid voting for or being a third party candidate. Citizens who choose or run outside of the duopoly are often labeled as spoilers, and perhaps for good reason. Consider the 2000 presidential election. Al Gore lost Florida, which ultimately decided the election, by just 537 votes. The third party candidate, Ralph Nader, he got over 97,000 votes in the Sunshine State. And keep in mind, because Gore and Nader were on the same side of the political spectrum, pundits and analysts were quick to point out that the Green Party candidate almost definitely spoiled the state for the Democrat. The rest, as they say, is George W. Bush's first term in office. Now, to discourage spoilers like Nader, many states erect barriers that make it exceedingly difficult to get on the ballot. In Florida, for instance, a potential presidential candidate needs nearly 120,000 people to sign a petition. That's just one example. There are different rules in all 50 states. And who decides on those rules? The state legislatures. And who controls the state legislatures? the Republicans or the Democrats. The duopoly, Rosenfeld explained, erect this complicated 50-state obstacle course to prevent third parties from threatening their dominance. Willen told me this type of self-serving behavior is akin to a violation of antitrust law. It's two powerful entities blocking the competition from entering the market. It has the effect, he told me, of preventing political innovation. Political innovation, he conceded, sounds like an oxymoron, but he told me there are a number of reforms out there that would better serve the diverse breadth of the electorate. For instance, he told me ranked choice voting would be an important step. So instead of picking one candidate for a given office, each voter ranks the candidates. If after the first count, no candidate has a majority of first place votes, the person in last place gets eliminated. Then you look at every ballot where the now eliminated candidate was ranked first, and you bump up the person in second place to first place. Then you redo the count. You continue this process until someone has a clear majority. This, Whelan explained, would eliminate the spoil effect because people would feel more comfortable voting by desire and not strategy. Maine has recently adopted ranked choice voting. Incidentally, Maine seems to be the state for those disgruntled with the duopoly. One of Maine's senators, Angus King, is an independent. Now, another potential innovation is multi-member districts. This makes the clearest sense on the congressional level. Think of a place like New York City. It is divided into 13 districts. Each district votes for one member of the House of Representatives, so voters are prone to play it safe by picking within the duopoly. They aren't inclined to waste their vote on a third-party candidate. However, under a potential multi-member district setup, the districts are lumped into one mega district that sends 13 members to the House. Now, voters might reason, you know what? There's no way that Libertarian Party candidate was gonna come in first place, but maybe she'll come in 11th. Hence, concerns about the spoiler effect fade away. Willen underscored other reforms, including the elimination of gerrymandering. He told me we can open up the primaries to include all voters, not just those registered to the party. That would lead to more moderate candidates. Look, I know this is all wonky and in the weeds and a bit confusing to follow, but our failure to engage on these issues is part of the reason we're stuck with the status quo. And if you step back and think about it, this system has sort of backfired on the parties themselves in recent years. That is, because it's so unlikely that a small party becomes a contender on the national stage, candidates who might be drawn to third parties, say someone like Bernie Sanders, are forced to run from within the duopoly. Donald Trump, for another example, sought the Reform Party's presidential nomination in 2000 didn't work. It was only when he packaged himself as a Republican in 2016 that he was able to make it to the White House. But Trump, and he'll tell you this himself, is far from your traditional Republican. I'd argue that he infiltrated the party, hollowed it out, and remade it in his own image. Whether or not this is a good thing for the Republicans is a different story. But my point is, because a duopoly has made it impossible for outsiders to compete, those outsiders have resorted to hostile takeovers. That means the political landscape keeps shifting. And that's part of the reason why so many of us feel without a political home. Wait, I'm a Democrat, but not a socialist. Hey, I'm a Republican, but not of the MAGA variety. In other words, I think the parties themselves would benefit from more competition. The country sure would. Okay. I'm gonna go live my life.